Okay, hey, this is Bishop Jackson on Affinity Extra, where we do extraordinary things. We're not just extroverted, we do extraordinary things. That's the new policy. That's the new policy, Roger. We're extraordinary people. So, um, on Affinity Extra this week, on Rock Solid, we're looking at um, a special documentary film that's coming out. And uh, we're going to be uh, blessed to be joined with Dr. Uh, Professor Robert Beckford. And uh, we're going to be sharing some thoughts around uh, that documentary film that is coming out, that has been shown across the country and will be shown in Birmingham at New Testament Church of God, The Rock, um, at 7 p.m. this evening. Um, and if this is coming on afterwards, it will be shown throughout the country, so you'll be able to see it. Um, and um, we, we will give you the links as to where you can connect with it. So on Affinity Extra this week, there's been some great things happening. There's been movement in government, and we know that there's been movement in the community. The Commonwealth is coming to hit us like a ton of bricks, and the roads, them is not ready in Peribar. May God have mercy upon Birmingham with its broke down um, situation. But anyway, at least the aquatic center is open in Smevik and all the roads are locked and everywhere is digging up. So there you go. So it's a bit of a busy time in Birmingham. But we welcome Dr. Professor Beckford. I've you got about 10 different names now. Professor Beckford, I'm going to call you right now because I'm so grateful for you to be on today. And thank you for your academia in the past and the present and also in the future. And uh, just let us know what's your, what's your, what's your uh, present project that you're doing outside of this movie. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me on the show. Always a pleasure to be with you. I'm currently working on a book on decolonizing gospel music. It will be out next year. I'm literally editing it as we speak. You may have seen me just multitasking there. Wow. So I just tied it with a few footnotes before sending it to the publisher. The book basically demonstrates how we can deal with colonial Christian ideas that mm -hmm. are still a part of gospel music narration because they're still a part of the Black Church tradition in Britain. And the book is based on my experimental gospel album called the Jamaican Bible Remix, which I made with 5AM Records back in 2017. So it's a kind of novel project. You have to read the book and listen to the album. Wow, okay. So we look, look, look forward to that because I think that that's been a bone of your contention for many years, that there's been no theology in the gospel music that we've been seeing presently. Uh, and there's been um, also no, no no conversation of of, uh, of, of 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 revolution in the gospel music as well. So um, I think you've been speaking to, uh, about that for many years. So it'd be good to see that project come to pass. So congratulations, and I think it's it's well necessary. It's well necessary. So we're looking at this project that we've got on the ground right now that I'm uh, really excited about and uh, a lot of people are talking about, which is the, the docu-film. Is it docu-film, would you call it that? Uh, a documentary. It's the a documentary. documentary. Okay. The classic, classic, uh, what we call um, an auteur please, okay. piece, which is uh, it's authored by somebody. It's like an essay. Right. So rather than it being the traditional television documentary, which I've done in the past, where it's about fantastic imagery. Yes. You know, you take people on a journey through a presenter. This is much more about talking heads, about right. people who have expertise in a particular area of the Christian story talking about it. And so these, these are individuals that are linked together with a narrative. And the narrative is simply, how did the church mm -hmm. in England get in bed with slavery? And right. how do we reconcile for this relationship? Right. That's, that's, that's the narrative in total. How did the Church of England, Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Quakers, how did they all justify being involved in the West Indian slavery business? What academics call racial capitalism? How did they get involved in that? How did mm. they then justify it theologically? So with that, that that's what we, we begin with. We mm. move on from there to then consider the implications of that, both in the past, because a lot of people just won't know one, which biblical text we use and how we use, and how they're used on the plantation. Yes. And how Christian theology then legitimated the kind of injustice, the racial hierarchy. Mm, okay, what is the theme of the documentary? Well, the theme fundamentally underlying it all is, is reconciliation. Right. How do we then atone for this past? If you've got a history where the Christian church has 
legitimated black subordination, said the Bible says that black people are ontologically inferior, inferior in terms of their being. Mm. And then even after slavery is over, 1834, 1838, still hasn't atoned for this past, still hasn't reckoned with it. How do we then reconcile? And that's what we're trying to deal with at the end of the film is what is the nature of Christian reconciliation? What do you need to do as churches in England to atone for your collusion with the witchcraft that was the transatlantic slave trade and the subjugation and brutalization of black bodies on the killing fields mm -hmm. of the West Indian plantations. That's the evil stuff. Right, yeah. The churches, the, the most we've ever got from them mm. is an apology. Right. We've never got a check. That's wow. what we're talking about in terms of reconciliation. What's the nature of the reconciliation? So one of the themes that comes out later on in the film is the question of reparations mm. uh, from church for their involvement and exploitation and profiting mm. from the transatlantic slave trade. Wow, I think that's, that's a mouthful. Why has it been called After the Flood? It's Why called it After called the Flood that? because mm -hmm. it, it's called After the Flood. It's a really good question because the story really begins in the Bible in Genesis 9. Right. When Noah gets drunk, mm -hmm. has too many tenants, and um, Guinness, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. it must be that. <laughs> his, son, his son see him naked. Yes. And there's this really bizarre story where Noah then curses Canaan. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it doesn't curse Ham, he curses his descendants, Canaan. Right. Mm -hmm. This story was misinterpreted in Christian history. We have the leading expert on the curse of Ham talking through this. Mm. Uh, David T. Goldberg has spent his whole life, literally 40 years of academic scholarship, showing how the curse of Ham story then was used to justify the enslavement of black people. But what he mm. shows us is how it was all based on misinterpretation. So the okay. Bible never said this, but Christian people, 17th, 16th century, used this text falsely to then justify the eternal servitude of black people mm. in the West Indies, Afri enslaved Africans yeah. in the West Indies. So it happens after the flood, not right. before it gets drunk. So we're playing with that whole curse of Ham myth mm. and its implications for today because it hasn't left us today. What happens in that, so how that story is misappropriated, mm. leads to the kind of social, economic and political injustices that we see throughout the North Atlantic, throughout Africa as well. Yeah, I, I think it's powerful because a lot of people don't realise this, but that is the reason why I wrote my book, The Power of Agreement. That is the whole reason why I wrote my book, The Power of Agreement. It's really wrapped around uh, doing an apologetic against the curse of Ham. Uh, I started with that thought and then it expanded into, into, into other thoughts as well. Because I thought that it would be reasonable to look at what covenants mean in terms of superseding this kind of minor curse that you find on an individual. And so what I was also looking at, what I researched also, is that you've got black studies uh, professors, which is, I think, L.L. Johnson, and I, and I think a couple of others used it as a methodology of answering about blackness in the scripture as well. And they looked at, and they looked at a couple of things. I'll tell you, this, is, this shocked me. One, they looked at what the, um, the rabbinic scholars said, because the rabbinic scholars said the curse of Ham meant that Ham then became black. The curse made him black, changed his hair texture, and then made him a, a servant for the rest of his life. So he's always cursed and his blackness demonstrates the curse. That's one thing. And then they also said the curse of Ham uh, came from him, uh, uh, Ham and his descendants having sex with animals on the on the on the ark therefore creating <laughs> yeah, it's a massive yeah. massive part you know johnson was yeah. mad with it i was like when i read it i was yeah. like what uh but it's part of uh it's part of white supremacist uh theology uh that says that this is why the slave is three-fifths human uh because he uh, because of the uh, ancient ancestors having sex with animals therefore you know they proved it scientifically obviously so that they could enslave them because they have no soul so th this is why mm -hmm. I, I i was determined to say uh, no matter what happens in this book i'm including it in there and so um so yeah so i think that when you when you when you catch hold of this it becomes subliminal in the life of the church though doesn't it would you i don't know if you agree or disagree because i always kind of thought about it because i i listened to a preacher one time and he said the reason why we are in this position is because of the curse of ham that's what the preacher said yeah uh, yeah, yeah 
a Pentecostal preacher. Yeah. He said, the reason why we are all in this position, why we're enslaved, why we're in the Caribbean, why we got no money is because of the curse of Ham. Well, well, I think, you know, in a kind of roundabout way, they're, they're, they're right, but they're wrong. And what mm. I mean by that is um, they're using it to suggest that that text actually legitimates mm. black servitude right. and inferiority. It doesn't. And what we show in the film tonight is that that interpretation is based on a misreading of Hebrew words. Mm. The word ham uh, was thought to mean black. It doesn't, mm. you know? So it was built on a misinterpretation of falsehood. Mm -hmm. However, the minister is right in the sense that because of that misinterpretation, yes. it's legal application to the treatment of black people in the West Indies in the, in, and in the Americas in terms of chattel slavery, mm. the dehumanization of people on the continent of Africa as a consequence of the misreading of that. But remember, this text was only renounced in the 1990s wow. by the Southern Baptists, mm. uh, you know, 1960s by other churches. So it's, it's got a lot of history right, in yeah. the Americas. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever been renounced in the churches in England, you know, they may have stopped using it, but nobody's ever said, you know what, we used this for a good hundred and so many years and we need to acknowledge that it was completely false and wrong and we, we need to atone for that. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's right in an indirect way about the way in which this text has had negative material and social consequences in history, but it's not as if we haven't resisted it. You know, black people who were colonized by the British and enslaved by the British didn't believe that. Mm. Plenty of evidence that they didn't believe that. In the 1831 rebellion, for example, in Jamaica, Sam Sharp or Bogle, mm. we have their, so Sam Sharp, William Gordon, we have Sam Sharp's reflections on the Bible. Mm. And he used the text to show that these ideas about black inferiority and black servitude were completely wrong. It's a book mm. by Oral Thomas called Resistance Hermeneutics, which examines the way in which the, on the cusp of emancipation, black preachers in Jamaica and across the Caribbean were reading against the verse of Ham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's so important and I would agree. Uh, and I would and I would say in two ways, I would uh, in two ways I, I, I kind of explained it. I said one, is that he's, he's dynamically wrong because he preached it as a divine act of God. And then I said, in another way, he is sociologically right, if you like, in a way, because it was used by, by corrupt human beings to practice mm -hmm. wickedness. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it yeah, was an eisegesis yeah, exactly. to practice wickedness. So two ways yeah. of kind of being able to look at it. So yeah. So mm -hmm. um, um, so who have you got involved? Who was involved in the project? And how did you become involved in this this project? Sure, Robert? sure. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. The story is that um, the movement of justice and reconciliation who funded the film and Noel uh, Alton um, Bell, who is the chairperson of the charity we'll talk about this tonight at the screening they basically got a gift from a well-wisher mm. and their plan was to use this gift this money to um, sail a ship around britain to tell the story of slavery in different ports and covid come along it made it very difficult for them to do that he told me about it and i pitched him an alternative i said look why don't we make a film mm. about the history because the biggest problem confronting us is ignorance People don't know about the church's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade and also how Christian theology was used and still works to produce anti-blackness. And, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So I took the idea to a production company that I've worked with in the past called Media, run by Roy Ackerman. And he helped us out in terms of facility support um, and, and with production support to get the film made. I worked with a filmmaker that I worked on some smaller projects with called Sheila Marshall. So a Christian, West African Christian, who is also a filmmaker. And we basically then developed the project and um, arranged for the filming to take place. It's going to take place in Britain, Caribbean, Barbados, and North America. In terms of the people that we have in it, we have some superstars right. of theology. Mm. Uh, you know, we have, for example, Willie Jennings, who's a professor of theology at Yale. Yeah. A superstar academic in terms of, there's a three brain African American man, a genius, mm. talks us through how whiteness, the concept of whiteness emerges from plantation society. Yeah. We also have within it um, uh, some really important historians 
of Caribbean slavery, Catherine Gervner, Travis Glass. And in the last few years, they've written the most important books on the church and slavery in the Caribbean and the Americas. They both are their place to brilliant American scholars. And then I won't tell you everybody else who's in it because we come to Britain. We have a British dimension to this in terms of looking at how this history impacted us, particularly in 2007, around the uh, commemoration of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Toyin Abetu makes an appearance. If you know Toyin is and Toyin's story yes. around 2007, you'll see the connections here. And right. then at the end of it, we have arguably the most important scholar in the last 15 years on Christian reconciliation, a guy called Miroslav Volf, okay. who also teaches at Yale, and he writes about the nature. How do Christians do reconciliation in response to great evil mm. based on the biblical text? What does the Bible say we do, and how does that relate to what we should go about doing in terms of this history of transatlantic slavery? I think that that's that's a powerful lineup. That's a powerful lineup. I think Willie Jennings wrote the book, wasn't it? After Whiteness. Is it After Whiteness? I think he wrote. That's right. Yeah, that's after right. After Whiteness. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's got the Christian imagination. Mm -hmm. It's got fantastic commentary on the Book of Acts. Yes. Um, you know, incredibly prolific writer, mm -hmm. brilliant scholar, deep thinker. I mean, yeah. And he he gave his time freely and willingly for this project. So we're mm -hmm. eternally grateful for these scholars because often. Um, you know, people don't make themselves accessible to work for, for literally free. Mm. And these guys are more willing to participate because it's all the value of the film, the importance of communicating this, this narrative. Yeah, I, th I think that's... It's, it's one of those things where you realise that the collective are really making a synergised effort that for me is now making a bigger impact. And I think it, 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 it speaks towards the future of synergized efforts this coming together now the mm, critical mm. elements of it what what is the critique that pushes against this what's the critique that pushes against um, this now well, well actually 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 you know what the reviews have been really fantastic if you go to mm. premier christian radio you'll see that in their magazine premier magazine there's a full page write-up which gives it five stars there's also another five star rating in um some of the evangelical i think christianity um, a magazine as well. So people have been very, very positive. I mean, um, I think in terms of the screenings that we've had so far, in terms of uh, London and in terms of Manchester, I, you know, people have been shocked. Mm. Mm -hmm. so much people were shocked that they didn't know this history right, wasn't right. taught to them. Yeah. And, and often bewildered there about how do we then reconcile? Right. How yes. do we actually, you know, because the reconciliation, we show them how it can be done. But, it seems quite daunting. Mm. There have been also some, you know, some um, uh, misinformed and ignorant perspectives on the film of people who haven't seen it. But I wouldn't right. even talk about it because, as an academic, as a teacher, you encourage students at the basic level of intelligence to read or see something before they comment on it. So right. Anybody yeah. comment on, on it without seeing it, I, I you know, my, my profession tells me that you just don't comment on stuff like that. That would reduce me to, you know, being back in kindergarten. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so we've been really pleased so far yeah. with the response. And check this out, you know, the Anglican Church screened it at Synod okay. this week, early this week because they yeah. wanted uh, their folks to engage with it. Also, it's been screened at the um, Lambeth Conference when the Worldwide Anglican Communion get together. That's yeah. happening uh, later on in this year. It's also being screened next week at the general meeting of the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. They are the modern incarnation of the old Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge, which okay. was the organization which ran the slave plantation in Barbados on behalf of the Anglican Church as part of the revelation right. within the film. Yeah, yeah, the church yeah. is actually running a slave plantation in Barbados. So we take the, the audience through that as well. Mm. And uh, the USP, due to their credit, are showing it at their AGM. And mm. then we engage with it because they were involved in it. And you know, we have meetings with them lined up next week in order to explore how we take this project forward because they're open addressing it. So I see that's a real move of the spirit. Mm -hmm. you now we yeah. screen this film and the people who are, who, have, uh, who are responsible for the damage mm -hmm. haven't closed up. 
have said we need to address this. Right. I I think that's powerful. In 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 coming into our stream now, when we're talking about Black Pentecostal churches, how do you think our response should be towards in terms of the movie, towards how now we now engage in um, 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 addressing the many aggressions of what happened to our people um, and then moving to the next stages because sometimes we move straight to reconciliation and we haven't even considered the wound. So how do we do that process uh, where, really where we've point. got this, something coming in between, you know, where you have this yeah. time of dealing with the wound and then moving to reconciliation. But you know what yeah. happens in our communities. We're always asked to forgive and forget quickly. And other communities yeah. get to lament, they get to mourn, they get to write text, and then they come to a time of where they consider reconciliation. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really brilliant question. I mean, I'll take that first and then work with, I think, well, two other important points for Black Pentecostals. I think that mm. reconciliation, one, one thing we have to do is recognise we have to avoid two things. The thing that you pointed out, which Digibonish would, would call cheap grace, making... Yes forgiveness and repentance too easy because it wasn't easy for Jesus to go to the cross. So mm. we've got to we've got to recognize what you've just brilliantly laid down as the first foundation. Black church has to do costly grace. We need to see the fruit of repentance. Mm. On the other side, the people who, who are responsible to the, the, the perpetrators of this injustice have to move beyond an apology because what the mainstream churches have become expert at in response to Black suffering mm. is just offering an apology. No mode of reconciliation, no um, uh, reparation involved. So they need to realize an apology is not enough. Mm. You know, the irony is that when missionaries came and told our ancestors about salvation, they demanded that there was, um, you know, we had to repent and we had to go and sin no more. Mm. When it's their turn now in response to us, all they want to do is to give an apology. Right. It's not repentance, it's a, it's a different kind of the gospel right. that they're, they're dealing with now than the one that they told us about. That, and so those are the first two things. I think the third thing is what this all brings to the surface is underlying the importance of theological education. Christian mm. education in the church needs to be opened up to talk about these issues. And similarly, you know, Christian education needs to be a, a foreground mm. in the education of black clergy and that obviously is my bag that's my thing that's why i'm promoting it and underlining it yes. but i think it's still very much part and parcel of what we have to do we still don't train up to a high enough standard black clergy within britain and the world's becoming much more sophisticated much more complex we need we need to do that so that was the, the repentance the theological stuff which i think is what we have to do mm. but it's, it's it falls back on the need to maintain high regard for Christian education amongst black clergy within Britain. Yes, I, th I think that's so important. Now, coming into a pure academia, Robert, do you think that in general theological circles that this part of history should be included in uh, church history. You know, when we do church history, we do we do uh, early church history, we do medieval church history, mm. we do you know, um, um, and then we do um, the, the Reformation church history. We do Reformation of every God place on the earth. But mm. as as I've learned in the whole of my time of studying Reformation church history, there was no mention of the church's involvement in slavery. Uh, and when you think yeah, about Reformation yeah, Church yeah, history, the yeah. big hard times of change were in the yeah. 14th, 15th yeah. and 16th century, where slavery was a massive thing. You know, so, yeah. so yeah. do you think that um, academia should really look again at what it teaches, especially in, the, uh, uh, in terms of looking um, towards this, this, this way of reconciling this, this, this challenging part of history? Yeah, completely. I would turn the question around, though, mm. and frame it slightly differently and, and say, why isn't it right. that 500 years of history mm. is omitted from Christian history, degree programmes, theological colleges within Britain? That's the question. And yes. it's omitted for three reasons. One, because there's a general historical amnesia within Britain when it comes to dealing with colonialism. Mm. They have deliberately omitted this material because it challenges ideas about British civility, British justice, 
and um, British supremacy. Let's just call it that, because everything collapses when you start. To, everything that you think is good about Britain collapses in the plantations. Mm. Justice, there was no justice. Equality, there's no equality. You know, um, um, you know, um, tolerance. You got to be, you got to be joking. Everything collapses. It collapses as well in terms of theology. The theology collapses. Mm. The idea of what salvation means collapses. How they interpret the Bible, it collapses. What what theological anthropology means, what it means to be human, what is the will of God, that collapses. Mm. So that's why they missed it out because they don't want to deal with what, what um, Victor Anderson, African American ethicist calls the grotesque. Mm. in life they don't want to deal with that we learn just as much from the grotesque as we do from the heroic don't want to deal with them with that so that's the first reason it, it, it challenges everything the, the second reason is emerges from the first one is when you address this history it changes everything mm. and a lot of people don't want change because if you read it as the way that we read it it then means that you can't talk about God in the same way. Right, that's right. That's why we have like, liberation theology. That's to a degree why there was Rastafari, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. it's still fine. But, you know, because they recognize once you address this history, it changes how we understand mm -hmm. and talk about God in the post-slave world. The mm -hmm. irony for me is this, you know, when I first started teaching at Birmingham University back in the early noughties, there was a department there, it was a center for post-Holocaust studies. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh, to be dealing with the Marfa, the Black Holocaust, because obviously I'm really interested. It was about the Holocaust in the 1930s, 1940s in Nazi Germany. Right, yeah. And then they argued in that post Holocaust scenario that you could not talk about God in the same way after the death of six million Jews. Right, yeah. The European scholars couldn't do that. And I thought, hold on a minute. So we got 24 million Africans who were brutalized, mm. murdered, trafficked tortured yeah we've got racial terror which is on the plantations we've got racialized discourse emerging out of that mm. and yet not one scholar saying we can't talk about god in the same way after right. the transatlantic trade down our participation in creating racial one yeah you know so, so let's just name it as it is mm. there has been theology has been corrupt mm. Mm -hmm. in mm. britain by not addressing this history. It's been corrupted by a spirit of deception mm. and deceitfulness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which perpetuates a lie that slavery wasn't that important, that enslaving Africans was good for them. Mm. And the biggest lie within all of this, that white people ended slavery. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think why it's a lie on two reasons. Why it's problematic. One, because it denies African agency, yeah. the African abol abolitionist, Equiano, uh, a lot of Equiano, Mary yeah. Prince, Sam Sharp. Mm. It denies the agency Paul of Bogle. all yeah. the African mm -hmm. It denies their agency. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, it's where it gets a bit more controversial. Sure. If we take seriously the work of um, 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 uh, uh, Wilderson mm. and the work of uh, um, uh, uh, Michelle Alexander mm. work on uh, slavery as being evolved into the, the criminal justice system then, and slavery hasn't ended, it's just evolved right. yes. so you see, so it, it helps to perpetuate lies mm. about what happened in the past and how it's manifested in the present and I've got strong enough to say that it, it's dishonest Right. And it's mm. mm -hmm. it's it's so important. And I think that um going into that, we haven't even got time to go into how far we would like to go into. So but the next time we will do that. So thank you, Robert, for really just allowing us to see the in depth of this um, this preparation that as we look at uh, the after the flood and everything else that is going to come from it we're going to be seeing a lot more discussion in particular areas of one especially for our community as well and so we really want our community to real to, to be able to come out to be able to talk to be able to look at their uh, the mini aggressions that are around them all the time that they can see that there is there's not only um, reconciliation but there is hope because we are a people of resistance and so that's really um, a part and parcel of how we would like to share that as well 
So thank you so much, Robert. Are you still with us? I hope you haven't disappeared. I'm still with you. Yes. I'm still with you. I'm still with you. Fantastic. Fantastic. So thank you My so pleasure. much. And we read we're, we're what we're we're very hungry for is for us uh, together as um, we're getting old now you can see the grayness in my beard I was trying to Grecian 2000 it but it's not going to work so but we want our children and our children's children to be able to connect with uh, this uh, um, conversation on resistance this conversation on reconciliation as well so I pray that that would be part and parcel of how we move this forward in our community as well so thank you Robert and we look forward to to one watching the film and to two uh, for these millennials who don't read much to read uh, Dopey Conqueror this is your book here and it's been selling like hotcakes because you all don't like to read long text so we're going to ask you to read this as an introduction to the rest of Robert's books okay so don't forget that and also you know you know you know your bishop's written a book and inside there is talking about the um, the curse of ham so it's the power of agreement uh, free advertisement Roger thank you very much anyway <laughs> thank you Robert so so much and we look forward to hearing uh, uh what's happening with your book as it comes out soon and um whatever god leads you to do thank you so much for just being a part of what the community happens and you know there's so many academics who talk about us they write about us uh, and they make money off us but they're not with us and you for one are still there and thank you so much for doing that and making a commitment to be a part of what our community develops and grows inside of it thank you so much well we My pleasure. Uh, no thank problem man. no problem so uh we are closing down on affinity extra on rock solid and we'll say goodbye to robert thank you so much and we will say to you next time we're going to get to the nits and grits of what else we're doing so this is about the film the documentary after the flood which dr beckford is leading in that and you know on rock solid we get to the nits and grits of culture of theology and and resistance that's what we do and this is our reboot this is our reboot into speaking about justice and what does uh, love look like in public uh, as corner west says love looks like in public it looks like justice god bless you take care this is bishop jackson signing out on rock solid thank you for listening to this content if you liked it please don't forget to like subscribe and make a comment down below or even more so check out our website www.affinityextra.com for more information